All right, thank you so much for staying with the Monday Report. This is a town hall session. We had mentioned to you that in the next 48 hours, Kenya joins the world in marking the World Anti-Corruption Day. But has Kenya made strides in the war against graft? This is a question we're asking. Use the hashtag Monday Report. Uh, Trevor Mbija at Citizen TV Kenya will sample some of your views. What more needs to be done? Let me introduce my guest real quick. Joining us online, Sheila Masinde. She's the De Executive Director of Transparency International. Thank you so much for making time for us. Again, joining us online is Dr. Amado Philip de Andre, UNODC Regional Representative Eastern Africa. Thank you so much for making time. With me in studio is Mwaniki Gashoka. He's the EACC Commissioner, thank you so much for making time, and Emily Kamau, Deputy Director, Department of Economic, Organized and International Crimes at the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, that's the ODPP. Thank you all for making time this evening. I see a lot of feedback coming through in regards to the question that we asked you earlier on. Wycliffe or Uma Osodo, because this is the show where your view comes first. We need not to lie, he says. Kenya is not making any strides to wide fighting corruption. Our port bellied politicians seem to be in the competition to see who loots the most. That is from Wycliffe Ouma and there's further views here from Robert Chesos who says corruption in Kenya is already a politicized issue and the legal system is blind to procedural procurement laws that are skewed by design. All right, that is Robert Chesoji there. Governor the Dreamer says, make corruption a predominantly economic and political issue rather than a predominantly legal, social, or ethical issue. Those are the recommendations he's making. And let's see one last one here before we get into it. Grace Torrey Teach says, I don't see even a single step Kenya is making towards the fight or rather to end corruption. If doctors can go to an extent of striking because of delayed salaries, how can we then say that we are fighting corruption? Let me start with Sheila Masinde here. She Sheila, the question from me on this one is, from the research that you have conducted as Transparency International, mm. is corruption getting better or worse? Thank you very much, uh, Trevor, for having this discussion. Um, I think on our side, based on the most recent corruption perception index that uh, Transparency International uh, conducts globally, Kenya has not burst out of the bottom rung of the CPI, having recorded a score of 28 out of 100, a score which fell below the global average score of 43 out of 100, and the sub-Saharan average score of 32. So when, we, when you look at how we're performing um, in, within the League of Nations, we're not doing so well. Um, and then also considering that in the last eight or so years, we have scored between 25 and 28 um, out of 100, um, having recorded a score of 27 in 2018, um, which really depicts slow progress in, in the fight against corruption. And really, one of the reasons why we believe that Kenya continues to register uh, uh, that very high perception of corruption is despite the myriad uh, efforts that have been put in place. Um, and, and of course, people are, are, are hopeful, you know, with all the high level public uh, officers and, and individuals who have been taken to court and charged and ongoing investigations that are on, I mean that are, that are, that that we, are, we expect will will head into court and will be prosecuted and uh, will be heard and determined uh, speedily and we will get convictions out of that. Yeah. But yeah. until we see this kind of results and also that we, we also put uh, ensure that whatever commitments we have made in the fight against corruption are, are actualized, yeah. then yeah. people are still we're, we're still hopeful. But until you see those those results coming out of those commitments and all these actions, then yeah. we would still say that we're still struggling in the fight against corruption. Allow okay. me to also mention that I think this year, as Kenyans, we have seen, we have witnessed the most egregious form of corruption with the theft of resources meant to insulate Kenyans against COVID-19. From what has happened this year, and you heard what the WHO chief said, that COVID-19 related corruption is, 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 it can be equated to murder yeah. because if health yeah. workers are, are without P PPEs, we are risking our lives, we are risking their lives, we are risking our lives as well. Yeah. And for me, mm -hmm. the, 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 the fact that we have seen a lot of corruption in this year during this period of this unprecedented crisis occasioned by uh, 
uh, COVID-19, then that's really an indication that we are not out of the woods yet yeah. um, in regard to, to the fight against corruption. Okay. So despite all the enforcement strategies that we have put in place, maybe it's it's time that we started looking at strategies that, you know, look into, into our moral consciousness and yeah. our value system as Kenyans. Okay. Dr. Amado, let me bring you in on this. Kenya's relatively poor performance and numerous anti-corruption indices, this we know by now. What are some of the recommendations for tackling corruption from where you stand in the Eastern African region which you represent? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, first of all, uh, UNODC is the, is the agency that is uh, specialized in, in supporting member states in the implementation of the UN Convention Against Corruption. So my first recommendation would be for, the, for our viewers to start thinking about evidence uh, when we judge a country, okay? So let's take the evidence and let's take uh, the five instruments that we have. We all know that corruption is obviously an economic uh, issue, right? Uh, corruption represents 5% of uh, basically uh, the cut in global GDP. And in Kenya, it represents about 7.8% of GDP lost because of corruption. But what, what are the gray areas and what are the solutions? I would, talk, uh, I would talk about five instruments. Number one, promotion of ethics and integrity. So UNODC is right now implementing a global uh, program called the Global Integrity Education Project. And Kenya is one of the pilot uh, member states where we are implementing this project with quite a, a lot of success, along with uh, countries, for example, like Mexico. So prevention and promotion of ethics is number one in the university system and also in the secondary schools. Number two, we have an amazing instrument, which is the UN Convention Against Corruption. So my second recommendation would be to take a look at the instruments that the convention gives us and then take them to the next level. And that is what Kenya is doing right now, led by uh, President Kenyatta and also the coordinating uh, CS uh, Matiangi. So we are supporting Kenya in, uh, in taking to the next level public procurement, financial investigation, whistleblower protection. These are some of the instruments that the convention is giving us. Number three, why don't we talk about digitalization? Kenya is one of the few knowledge economies we have in Africa. So what we are doing with the, with the youth, we have launched some months ago, the youth hackathon competition, whereby we have identified in Kenya, some of the top blockchain developers that will help us fight corruption, for example, in the public uh, sector. And yeah. tomorrow, we are going to start um, um, uh, basically inaugurating the, the, UN, the UN International Day Against Corruption. And yeah. we are going to be giving with authorities in Kiambu County prices to these winners of the hackathon. So digitalization, I would say, is the third instrument we have to start using. Okay. The fourth instrument is protection of witnesses. And then the other one is prosecution. And just let me give you one very good piece of information. When we say that the judiciary is not doing anything, I completely disagree. If we take, for example, the data from the ODPT and the, and the, and the judiciary, yeah. we have a, one example that tells us that something is being done right. The convictions rates for uh, corruption cases have increased from, you know, for example, 47% uh, back in January of uh, last year to 63%. This is huge. And we have right now in the judiciary about 135 high impact cases, yeah. including yeah. senior government officials worth 224 billion Kenyan shillings. But what is needed still? I would say we need to start thinking about more interagency networks. Networks whereby, for example, DCI and ODPP work together in high impact cases. Yeah. We need to start promoting yeah. mutual legal assistance. And we need to start thinking and this is something that the Kenyan judiciary and other people is thinking about, the establishment of specialized courts to fight corruption and corrupt cases. Okay. Ma Madam Kamal, let me bring you on this, and it's an interesting thing that has been brought by Dr. Mado, prosecution. Yes. So in Kenya, most citizens say that they want the big fish to be prosecuted. Why isn't this happening? What challenges are you facing when it comes to prosecuting the big fish? Uh, thank you very much, Trevor. I would say that indeed we are prosecuting big fishes because, for instance, we have seven uh, s former and sitting governors. We have former ministers who are being prosecuted. We have cabinet secretaries who are being prosecuted. We have members of parliament being prosecuted. We have M MCAs and other county government officials yeah. and other parastatal heads. Uh, those, I would say, they are big fishes.
The main problem with uh, prosecuting big fishes is that they also have their own following. If it's a governor that you are charging, you'll see that you'll be escorted by people full of rories. And in fact, even to access that court will be difficult because you'll be surrounded by his people saying that this is our thief, leave him alone. Yeah. The same with members of parliament, the same even with MCAs. That means Kenyans will only see a person as corrupt as long as he's not from them. But as long as it's somebody else, now they can say that that is corruption. Even those ones who are in the bank facilitating the corrupt deals, yeah. they also have their own people who do not want them to be prosecuted. Now the problem comes when a senior person is being prosecuted and statements have to be recorded by those officers who are under him. Let's say like a governor and you have county government officials who are supposed to record statement and come and testify against that person. Yeah. It used to be very, very difficult for us who are prosecuting to prosecute those people because uh, uh, the witnesses would record very good statements, but once they come to court, they would refuse to, to testify against the, the, their, their boss. Definitely, understandably so, because uh, they know that that's where their, their bread comes from yeah. and they do not want to lose it. But that is no longer the situation because immediately you are charged with an economic crime. Yeah. Even if you are a state officer, you are supposed to, to keep off your office until the case is finalized. Yeah. Again, the next problem is that these are managed people. They'll hire the best advocate. I'm not saying it's bad to hire an advocate. They are entitled by the constitution to hire an advocate. Mm. However, they keep finding uh, myriads of application, yeah. arranging breaches of their constitutional rights, breaches of this and that. Yeah. And then the, the, the application will go from the lower court to the high court to the, to the, uh, to the Court of Appeal mm. and even to the Supreme Court and the whole journey. And our law allows it so they can file multiple. So if we have a case with 10 people, yeah. this one files some cases here and another one files here. Sometimes they even file outside that jurisdiction. You might know that somebody is having a case in Nairobi mm. and you hear that they have already gotten a stay in Mombasa. So the prosecutor has to rush from Nairobi and go and, and uh, defend that case in Mombasa. Yeah. In the meantime, the case is Nairobi is not moving. So that keeps on going on and on and on. And it's kind of meant to delay. Yeah. You know, once a case is delayed, maybe witnesses will get tired because they'll keep on coming and yeah. they are not heard. Sometimes documents m might get lost in the process of all that. Yeah. And that is intentional. Okay. The delaying tactics is meant to make sure that the that the case is just not moving. Okay. And sometimes even, even witnesses die in the course of time. If a case is taking too long, mm. you they even relocate. So yeah. those are the, some of the major problems that we are having. Okay. And in the process, some yeah. of the witnesses get compromised. Mm. Because if you've been coming and the case is not being heard, yeah. because you are told today you are supposed to be heard, but this application is being heard first before the hearing of the witnesses goes on. And then the witness has left his business, he's yeah. not being paid to come and testify. Next time you call him, he will not show up. Yeah. And he might get bought by these people. Okay, this is by far the most co candid conversation I've had in a while. Commissioner Moniki, so right now as we speak, how many corruption cases related to COVID-19 is ESCC dealing with? And what is the status? Th th thank you, Trevor. I, I, I would want to put, uh, before I answer that question about the cases we are handling, you know, relating to COVID-19. Yeah. I would want us now that we are celebrating, you know, the International Corruption Day on the 9th of December, to put this uh, debate in perspective so that we look at ESCC, you know, globally. I've been in ESCC myself now for five years. And as I pack my bags, the question I'll be asking myself, what have we done in the fight against corruption? And I can tell you, in those five years, we have dealt with like 800, concluded 800 cases, some of them very high profile, in terms of asset recovery yeah. in those five years. And the, the data is there. We have recovered assets close to 20 billion. And the, the statistics are there. We are pursuing, and this is very key in the fight against corruption. Yeah. We are pursuing individuals who cannot explain their wealth. Right now, we are pursuing individuals. Um, the total amount is about eight, uh, no, three billion, which they cannot account. And we have judgments in our favor. We have already recovered like two, two hundred million. So there are many other things we are doing. 
and the very important before now I answer that question, yeah. the jurisprudence. You know, the corrupt in this country, the jurisprudence was helping them. Because up to 2016, there was a ruling that was given in 2005. Yeah. When you are going against an individual who is not unable to, uh, to account for their wealth, the burden had been shifted to ESCC. But now we have very nice jurisdiction, jurisprudence set out by the courts, mm -hmm. that if you cannot be able to explain your wealth, you forfeit it to the state. And this is where now I can bring in the issue of the, the COVID-19. Yeah. Because it, it, for me, I sit here very angry because I thought after um, NYS1, NYS2, that we will never have you know, this kind of imputed impunity again. Yeah. On the 20th of March 20th year, uh, uh, this year, when COVID broke out, our CEO, we issued a circular to the governors, to the ministries. We said, there is a pandemic. And we know how Dover people try to take advantage yeah. of emergencies to, to root money from the public. And despite that warning, people still went ahead and actually went to, and that shows you the, the, the impunity. But to answer your question, I'm very happy that right now, the first thing that we did, what happened is that from experience, especially with the counties, yeah. we would say we are going f for X, Y, Z. Then you get a mysterious fire. The documents are burnt. So the first thing we had to do with the COVID-19 investigation was to secure the evidence. Yeah. And we have secured that evidence. And for me, that is the most important. Are the documents there? We yeah. don't want mysterious fires. The documents are there. And then we, once we got the documents, we realized there are so many companies that are involved. In total, we are talking about eight companies. Yeah. You cannot investigate all of them at the same. So we, we faced it. Now we have finished phase one. We have about eight companies. I will not give the details. We have finished our, inv uh, our investigations. Yeah. We gave the files, to, the files to the DPP. They came back with some cover points. And which is good, by the way, there's nothing wrong with cover points because they're saying Titan these uh, rupees, taking yeah. these boats so that these guys don't get away. And we have completed, right now, the file is again for review, the files are, are APP for review, and we expect, yeah. on our part, we are expecting that we should be taking people to court uh, any, any time soon. How many and people then, are we looking at, roughly? Because so we, those, those eight companies we are talking about, a minimum of not less than 30 people, which is, will include public officials, will include even the suppliers, yeah. anybody who was involved. So, but... That is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. Because remember, I'm saying that those are just eight. Yeah. So we still have another 72. But you'll be going with our, we have already started now phase three of our investigations. 72 companies? Yes. All right. Sheila, let me bring you back into this discussion. When you hear the issues that are coming up for the investigating agencies and also the prosecuting agencies, what then is yeah. the solution? For example, what uh, Madam Kamau said, that someone can get a stay order in Mombasa and the case is in Nairobi. What, how do we sort that sort of uh, miscoordination? Mm. <clears throat> I think in terms of, uh, and I think we understand, we, we understand some of the challenges that uh, the, the ODPP, uh, even the investigative authorities have raised uh, over the years in regard to prosecuting corruption. I mean, they, they, they always say, you know, that this, the corrupt can be really smart and corruption always smi uh, fights back. So it's really important that we start looking into uh, very stringent um, case, case management st strategies. I think the idea of using legal experts, analysts, I, I mean, of course, we know that, uh, yes, I know the ODPP has also tried to hire very competently and so on, but as even as um, as she has mentioned, that the, the truth is that the corrupt uh, the corrupt suspects will you, you see the kind of uh, the high defense walls that they, that they build and they get the best uh, lawyers to be able to defend them in court. In fact, remember that at that time I was joking that when when a politician or a high level Kenyan is is taken to court, you'll find almost thirty lawyers, you know, uh, squeezing themselves in that small courtroom. Um, just to fit into that small space to defend one person. But this is the kind of defense that then our prosecution teams are up against. So using legal experts um, and analysts, you know, investing in research is really critical in powering 
uh, uh, prosecution strategies so that we're able to scale up the high walls of defense that yeah. are typically mounted by the corrupt. Also, I think it's important that they continue to invest in capacity building to, to, to better equip not just the prosecutors, but other uh, actors within the anti-corruption justice chain. I think the, the capacity strengthening, the research on, on an understanding on, on key emerging trends, uh, jurisprudence from the courts, and also just how to manage sensitive and complex cases and procedures is really key in powering up the conviction rates in regards to corruption. Because even with globalization yeah. and all yeah. the growing cross-border nature of corruption, it's going to become more difficult to, to, to investigate and, prose and prosecute these cases. So we really must invest in capacity strengthening and research and use of and, and legal expertise uh, to be able to, and also the use of, and also invest in the use of technology yeah. uh, to, uh, that, uh, that, uh, to be able to, to beat uh, corruption and enable prosecutors and investigators to keep pace with emerging and complex uh, crimes. This is really critical to enhance the quality of investigations and, and prosecutions in the face of robust legal battalions that are really put up uh, by the accused persons. Okay. Dr. Amando, let me bring you back into this conversation. So the world is marking the World Anti-Corruption Day in the next 48 hours from now. They, we are focusing this time on COVID-19 and corruption. What does that mean for Kenya in light of the recent corruption scandals that we've seen at the Ministry of Health? Well, f first of all, the, I mean, clearly COVID has exposed the loopholes in our systems, not only in Kenya, everywhere. So we need to start thinking about where the loopholes are. One of the key loopholes that we have seen is in the procurement systems. So one, one, of, the, one of the lessons learned is that we need to start bringing in digital solutions, blockchain solutions, where, for example, you have a distributed app, which is encrypted end to end, and that's, that distributed app gives full transparency in the procurement processes. And I'm thinking about now uh, bringing the COVID-19 vaccine starting in uh, January or February of next year. We need to bring these digital solutions in all processes. And UNODC uh, can hopefully support the government of Kenya to do so. Um, so that, that is one. But also we need to start thinking, we already have really good systems in place. We have a very strong ODPP and we have a very strong PCI. Why don't we start thinking more and more about bringing interagency teams to prosecute very difficult cases of corruption, whereby we see more and more uh, jurisdictions involved in these cases. And this is the case, again, of Kenya and any other jurisdiction. Let's not forget, Kenya is a knowledge economy. So it has all the instruments available to, to start using digitalization and interagency um, uh, networks to fight corruption. All right. Madam Kamau, you know, the DPP's performance is really based on the quality of prosecutions, and this we know, yet we have seen instances where the DPP sometimes drops charges after having forwarded them for prosecution. So what really changes between the time when the DPP decides to prosecute a case and then reversing that to be dropped again? Okay, thank you very much. Let me first of all say, before the DPP files a charge in court, especially these high profile corruption cases, a lot of work is done behind the scenes. And we have a lot of interagency corroboration. We have prosecution teams which work, like if it's the ODPP team, works with the EACC team. So that when, once we move it, quote, we are moving as one because interagency corroboration is very, very important. Now, once the DPP is satisfied that there is sufficient evidence and there is a case, prosecutable case, and there is, it passes the test of public interest, and we file charges in court. Once a case is charged in court, a matter may be reviewed on this, uh, in, in such an instance, like advocates also write to us, all the accused persons write to us, some of them volunteer other evidence that had not been disclosed to us, which might have been in their possession. Yeah. Some documents which they could have hidden and once now they know that they are charged before court now, they release it. After we analyze such evidence, we realize that this accused person is more valuable in assisting us to prove the case against the, the most culpable person. Because uh, we have been in the past challenged that we are sweeping everybody. We are taking 20 persons, 20, 30 accused persons, yeah. yet we should focus on the key suspects, the ones who are highly culpable. So if we get these other persons willing to corroborate and assist the prosecution, then it's allowed world over. The Constitution allows the DPP to institute yeah. 
to undertake and also to withdraw with the leave of the court, as long as not in the abuse of the process of the court. Yeah. So if we think a person will help us unravel the mystery, get us to know where the money went, then this person, even if they were, they were also Mention. involved, even yeah. if they are also an accomplice, and they are going to help us get to know more about this matter, get to know where the money is hidden, get to know much more than we knew, mm -hmm. then in such circumstances we can withdraw a case. Okay. Yes. Commissioner Mwaniki, you know, former Auditor General Edward Uko said that in Kenya, corruption is budgeted for. So as the ESCC, what <laughs> are you doing to ensure that you nip it at the bud? before it even happens. You mentioned having sent an, a warning to the counties and yet they still went ahead and looted part of the funds. What are you doing to ensure that corruption is nipped at the bad? Okay, l l let me say this. I, I wish it was that easy that uh, we can go to the budgets and find, you know, an entry corruption. But I know what the Auditor General meant. From my own research at TSEC, 70% of all the cases in Kenya are related to corruption. Uh, the, all of them arise from procurement. So it means there are people who are misusing the procurement process. And personally having been involved in the uh, making of the regulations, you know, public procurement regulations, we have the best regulations, we have the best act of parliament in terms of regulating procurement. But then the problem is that how are we, you know, implementing that act? And this is where now ECC comes in. You know, there's something that uh, has not been given the, the attention that it deserves. Yeah. As ECC, we use, you know, our own investigators, intelligence, to find out how 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 procurement is being done, and we have gotten, we have disrupted. In fact, in terms of disruption, and again, these are cases, and those data, the data is there. We have disrupted, like in the last five years, not less than 96 uh, billion of money that should have been paid out. Remember, even for the COVID-19, we are talking about, we were still able to disrupt payment of uh, 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 several billions. It was in the newspapers last year. Again, it's a matter of public uh, d debate. We stopped a procurement for one of the government ministries, 4.6 billion, and the contract had been signed. Okay, that case we are now investigating. We have com uh, completed the fact that they never took the money does not mean they are not guilty. But that shows that at ECC we are aware of what the Auditor General is saying, that we need to be on the lookout. And we are on the lookout. And the message I would want to give, especially to the accounting officers, you know, there's something in the world called uh, influence pedras. These are or what we call cartels in Kenya. These are colorless people or shadowy people. You don't know them. But they use you, they will intimidate you, or they will make you look very important when you are giving them tenders. But remember, when the dust has settled, they are nowhere to be seen. They have yeah. in the, the, the near. There will be nothing to show this is the person who was pushing me from the background because they just disappear. So my message is that if you are the one in charge of implementing that budget, kindly do it in accordance with the law. Okay. Yes. Uh, I want to take a quick break on the Monday report. When you come back, there's a lot of questions coming through. Use the hashtag Monday report. I see a lot of them here. We'll sample some of them right after this, plus your video questions as well. We're talking about slaying the corruption dragon. We're back in a bit. <laughs> 